Efficiency Center coordinate the research on uh, buildings. Um, so I don't want to take a lot of time from our great panel. Uh, you came to see them, not me. Um, so we have uh, three stories of three specific buildings from uh, three different owners. Uh, James McKenzie from Swinerton, then uh, Swinerton Builders, um, Craig Neyman from uh, Packard Foundation, and then Stephen Sonetzer from NASA Ames. Uh, so they will be our first three speakers, and then uh, Steve Selkowitz from LBNL will wrap up uh, the liberations from our panelists with a bit of a broader perspective. But I've asked all of the speakers as much as possible to reflect on the best building that they know of and have experience with in their own portfolio, and then extrapolate to market and broader considerations uh, from that experience. Uh, because personally, um, I sometimes struggle a bit with this term zero. Uh, for some people it's exciting, for others it's a downer. Um, so that's one of the things I'm interested to figure out today uh, from the panelists. You know, how practical is net zero really? How desirable is it really? Is it truly the right goal for us to have? How close are we to getting there? Um, what have organizations done to get there? What are they planning to do? Those are some of the questions that uh, I have in my mind that I hope uh, we can get some answers to from the panelists. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, James McKenzie from Swinerton, Building, from Swinerton Builders, who will share the story of their San Diego office with us and then uh, broaden from there. Thanks, James. Thank you, Martin. It's uh, great to be back on campus. Actually, before I joined uh, Swinerton, I, I worked here at Stanford on the operations side, managing capital projects. So, and I've known Martin for a number of years, so it's great to see him. So, James McKenzie, Director of Center for Excellence. So let's just jump right in. Um, assuming our slides will <laughs> advance. Whoops. There we go. As we continue rebuilding from the Great Recession, the proverbial question is, how are you doing? Did you survive? The big difference in this post-Great Recession world is, not, is that the question is not about you, your family, your company, your country, but your network, your community. So what's going on? <clears throat> in this new world, we're starting to exit our silos and becoming an integrated, networked society. Neuroscience teaches us that when we're part of our network, our brains work and feel better. Our connected world now understands the impact of the built environment and how it contributes to a very large proportion of energy consumption and the production of carbon dioxide. We are now at the point, and I, you know, Stephen Chu made this clear, we have sort of have, I call it an ethical, but he calls it a moral responsibility to solve this global problem. As an organization, Swinerton has been answering the call of sustainability for over four decades, but our business model also puts us in the position of being owners. In, on, from time to time, we actually buy our own offices and build them out. So we find ourselves being in this unique position of being the owner and the operator and the builder and designer. <clears throat> the convergence of new technologies, processes, and human awareness are pioneering a new era in commercial um, sustainability. And with that is the introduction of net, the net zero concept. We achieved net on this project, we achieved net zero through a combination of sophisticated project delivery, technology, and human collaboration. And it was quite a journey. Every project has its own uh, characteristics, problems, and issues, but truly this one was sort of epic, at least for, for our organization. Every journey has a starting point. The pro this starting point is that we had a business need for a new San Diego office, an initial search uh, opportunity came up to actually buy an existing building and some surrounding land. And when we did the analysis, it actually was more cost effective for us to buy and renovate this building rather than going out and leasing someone else's property and building it out. So this story has several plots to it. First of all, collaboration. That collaboration and integration, a multi and I mean multidisciplinary integration, this project would have never been able to hit net zero. <clears throat> our ability and our Expertise in solar power design was another subplot that made this happen. Adoptive reuse of existing buildings, codes and regulations. California is destined for net, 
or net zero by 2030 for new commercial applications. It's better for us as practitioners to be ahead of the curve. And of course, our cultural commitment to sustainability. So planning, this is where the game is won or lost. Historically, project success has always been won and lost in the planning stage. What made a difference for us here is that we were guided by our business drivers, which was set by our, our executive leadership. <clears throat> so our first strategy was to choose where we're going to put our emphasis in. Is it going to be in the exterior of the building or the interior? We chose, we did do some um, enhancements to the front, but we decided at the end of the day it was better to put our money into the interior because that's where we're frankly where we do all our work. Our second strategy or kind of game-changing design consideration was our HVAC system. You know, when you look at the building, it's basically a, a plain box. It would have been very, the first impression is you just put in a, a rooftop package air system and call it a day. But we did some extensive analysis and determined that a central plant featuring a, a central chiller and boiler, a four-pipe um, hydronic system actually uh, had the payback that made sense over the long-term use of the building. So design, this is sort of another, where this was sort of a game changer for us. You know, working with the design team, you know, a lot of our senior executives didn't grow up in the era of CAD or even building information modeling, so they grew up in the era of blueprints. But the thing is, designs now are so complex and so intricate that you need sort of a new technologies. We use 3D modeling to allow, them, allow us to communicate this new visual communication method that actually uh, allowed senior level people to make quick decisions and, and understand the, the project. So the design definitely reflected our, our desire for a fresh, progressive, and modern space. <clears throat> so since construction was uh, done using the design-build method, it was a seamless transition going in from design and construction. You know, when you're in design-build, sometimes you don't know when the design ends and the construction starts and vice versa. So it was a very fluid process, but it was very seamless. Um, of course, being able to do self-performing work, since we are builders, we actually have some of our own crews that perform some of the work in terms of uh, wall partition, carpentry, and such. It also meant that we were heavily involved in the design and getting the details down to a science. The details that not only made it easy to install, but also gave long-term uh, performance, which reduces our operating costs and maintenance cost. So here's where it's a little different. When you have to pay the bills, and you're the owner of the building, and you're also paying the bills for the payroll, your perspective is radically different. So that was our perspective on this project. So, but our efforts in planning design were for, truly from the viewpoint of an owner. So when you look at the overall design features, it was designed to attract younger, smarter employees. We all know now that if you look at your typical millennials, they're into the green as a factor. Green is a factor where they want to go to college. Green is a factor where they want to go to school. Design matters to them. They want that coolness. They all grew up in the, uh, the Apple iPad and iPod. And uh, did I leave one pod out? <laughs> they grew up in the I world, so coolness is important to them. You know, Swinton is not a, we're not a McDonald's. We don't have this sort of corporate worldwide look and feel. It's very branded locally because we live in, in those communities. Our employees live in that area. They stay there. They don't, we don't move them around all over the United States. So the local brand was important. You know, we needed a lot of public versus private space. You know, it's great to have open collaboration space, but sometimes you just have these delicate conversations that require privacy. So we needed that aspect. And, you know, we needed some event space, not only for our own people, we want to host a lot of different outside organizations to have conferences. So this space allowed us to have indoor-outdoor conference space. And if you look at that area where our office is, it's kind of this classic Mesa Verde, almost sort of like a southwestern look and feel to it. That was reflected in the design. Of course, having 18-foot high ceilings is very striking architecturally, but that also presents challenges in, as far as energy usage. So getting into specifics, we, we have this branded entrance that uh, it's the mo most obvious feature. It rises above the existing paraffin to, you know, to provide sort of a, a focal point to enter the building. Here's where we really where we make dramatic differences. We use a lot of natural light. Uh, this is an existing concrete tilt-up, so we punched a lot of holes into the side of the concrete to lend the, the natural uh, lighting. Um, during the daytime, there's actually a, enough natural light provided for the majority of the office spaces, allowing nearly 50% of the um, artificial lighting to be turned off. And keep in mind that natural light is just much more pleasant light. You know, the color temperature and everything just puts you in a great mood. You know, we call that sunny disposition. Well, that's important. So in artificial lighting, 
we, we consider less is more. We took a multi-pronged collaborative approach that was needed to find a comprehensive lighting plan that was both functional and also saved as much as considerable amount of energy. As I mentioned, getting HVAC off the roof uh, opened up new opportunities for us. It allows us to put a complete solar array panel on the roof. It also allowed us to install uh, GPS tracking skylights. We use a lot of recycled materials all over the place. You know, our, our heritage was in construction and carpentry, so this it was sort of a theme, but there was a lot of opportunity to take recycled woods, not only for wall decoration, I think our front entrance desk had it, and also our uh, conference room tables used recycled wood. They were actually uh, designed by artists, and they ended up being quite, quite beautiful. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. So the perimeter offices, by br punching holes in the exterior to bring in a natural light, we put glazing on the interior of the conference to allow that light to spill out into the open office area. So here's where the game-changing event occurred. Um, it was our ability to put a complete solar array on the rooftop, 70, 75 kilowatt. Um, Swinner does have a background. We have a, whole, a complete renewable energy group, so it allowed us to completely design, fabricate, and install this, this on the roof. So it's, and that's really where the game-changing event. Our knowledge of that allowed us to do this, so we can confidently predict how much it was going to cost to design, and build, and install, and monitor and maintain the system. So sort of an added feature, we, um, a couple of years ago, we developed a software called Solve, which allows uh, the monitoring of solar panels on behalf of our clients. So you can you monitor an entire solar uh, power plant uh, remotely, because we were finding that we were sending maintenance people out for problems that weren't really a, a serious problem. This allows remote um, monitoring that uh, our clients are now realizing that it's, it's a great sort of value add. We actually sell the software to solar power plants that we didn't design and build, so it sort of opened up a whole new market for us. So. That was sort of another piece that we had in our toolbox that really kind of pushed us over the edge towards getting to, to um, net zero. <clears throat> sort of kind of making the story a little bit better is that, you know, in California, uh, electric vehicle is really expected to increase. So we wanted to be part of, part of that, so we put in a charging station. So we also use GPS track skylights. It's a new technology, but it uses mirrors and a, a, a tracking motor to optimize the amount of sun coming in and also reduces um, uh, heat during peak times. So the flooring was a big part of it. Usually you don't put a lot of vet thought into flooring, but really wayfinding is an issue in a lot of places, especially sort of newer places that don't have these classic 90 degree turns. So that, that was a big feature for us and we put a lot of effort in it. But once again, it was a collaboration between the designer, the installation, and the carpet manufacturer. So flexible workstations were a big part that allows that collaboration. And in summary, what did we learn? Well, we learned that our clients' business drivers are critical. High-performance buildings can only be achieved through integration and collaboration. And advanced visualization is critical to sort of have that common communication tool. And you know, what are some of the outcomes? Well, the building has become a model for adaptive reuse. We now have improved employee satisfaction and recruiting. Uh, and we we're seeking lead platinum. So, and to finish with, sustainable design can be beautiful. They're not, you know, oxymorons, so they, there definitely can be a connection to them. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Craig. While, uh, I mean, James, while Craig Neyman from the Packer Foundation is setting up. Um, so have you measured the energy performance and uh, where are you guys at? Well, yeah, you know, first... The solve mon the software that we that I mentioned um, helps us monitor it in, in real time. Um, it actually gets down to the level they can individually monitor each individual solar panel. So we have it to that level of, of detail. And, and what about in the building in terms of the uh, the loads uh, from the building? How much of that are you able to offset? And uh... yeah, it, it, we are able to offset 100% of our. Uh, energy usage using photovoltaic. You know, we're still connected to the grid, obviously, for nighttime and and um, and sell, selling back to the the utility company. Thanks. We'll we'll go through all the presentations and then we'll have time for Q and A. So I I'm sure you're all familiar with the cliche of think globally, act locally. So now from the kind of uh, interstellar rhetoric of Carl Sagan to going a little bit closer to Earth in one small structure, is, and it's the story of that structure that I want to share with you today. 
I'm Craig Naiman. I'm the CFO of the Packard Foundation. The Packard Foundation is a grant maker funding not-for-profits throughout the, throughout the world. Uh, we started in 1964 with four major grant areas. One of those grant areas was in, in conservation. And while uh, uh, words like sustainability and net zero weren't in the vernacular back then, we were still giving to environmental issues even then and still do to this day. And so in, the, in that spirit, um, when it came time to expand our resources, uh, facilities, and build a new building, we had to tackle the question of what does it mean to be, build a green building? What would that look like? So we look, focused on two major measures. One was LEED Platinum certification, and the second was net zero energy, defined at, uh, as within the course of a 12-month period, all your PG&E bills struck, uh, strung together would indicate that you generated more than, than the amount of energy that you actually utilized. Now, from a LEED Platinum perspective, um, we're aware that there's probably about 70 to even 100 buildings in the state of California alone that have achieved LEED Platinum. So you're, we're in fairly good company there. We, we got our 94 LEED certified points and uh, we're set to go. On the net zero side, however, it's a little more challenging terrain. The new building institute uh, in a March 2012 study indicated that there was as, as few as 21 buildings with credibly modeled, that's their terms, uh, net zero results in, in, in the entire country. And of those 21, uh, our research indicated that there's a, as few as two that are actually certified as net zero, although that number could be growing. One, an ideas building right here in San Jose, and another is a community center outside of Salem, Salem Oregon. So there's very few that have been certified. Uh, the certifier, it's not a big business, International Living Futures Institute uh, is, is, is ones that are performing that service. Um, so our objective was we got to build uh, this net zero. Oh, and another feature that I want to point out was of the 21 buildings, only two of them were in excess of 15,000 square feet. So most of the net zero that has been done thus far is on a much significantly smaller scale. So the scale of the building that we're talking about here for our headquarters office is 50,000 square feet. It's in two predominant wings with connectors in between, allowing for a very pleasant courtyard in the center. It has capacity for 124 persons. That's about 400 square feet of office space. To get the, the um, productive power on the net zero uh, objective, we installed some 915 solar panels, 405 on each of those two wings. It generates, is expected, well, has 300 kilowatts of uh, generating capacity, and it's expected to generate between 250 to 300 megawatt hours of electricity per year. It took us uh, less than $2 million for costs of planning, design, and purchase of the solar panels and installation, and we expect the payback period to be about 10 years or so. Um, so we're, we're going to generate 250 to 300 megawatt hours of electricity a year. The challenge is in the 50,000 square foot, foot building, conventionally built, the utilization of energy might be somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 to 800 megawatt hours. So while we can generate two, 250 to 300, we had to reduce by some two thirds from a typical office building our, our energy use. And there's, you know, as most of you are I'm sure aware, there's three major areas of a building's energy use. Typically about 40% in HVAC, another 30% in plug load, another 30% in lighting. So we had to take each of those three areas and try to reduce our energy utilization by as much as two thirds. The first strategy that we did was to, working with integral uh, systems engineering, we put together um, chilled beam construction, which serves as our heating and cooling. Now chilled beam are very predominant in Europe, but very, very much less so here. The basic concept is throughout the building you have a, a small little uh, piece of duct work. It's about a quarter the size of typical duct work. And beneath it you have uh, two beams, uh, a, a, a beam of chilled water and a beam of heated water. And basically you float air through the duct work. It comes and um, sprays out over the uh, chilled beam to actually give you some, some cooling. Uh, that allowed us to take advantage of some of the natural cycles here in the uh, Silicon Valley area. So for example, 
and that we have a large diurnal temperature range um, in the summers in, in, in Palo Alto where you can get as 80, 85 during the day, 50, 55 at night. What we actually do is we have a compressor-free chiller that sits aside our building that allows us to cool of the water during the, during the night, store it in two 25,000 gallon storage tanks underneath our main conference room during the day, then pump it throughout the building to allow this chilled beam construction to um, uh, cool the building with significantly less energy than uh, a typical system. We have 100% naturally vented air. Uh, this slide is intending to depict the operable windows that we have in all of our offices. Um, the, the reduced duct work in a chill beam construction allows that we only have three uh, main air handlers in the entire building. And with those three air handlers, uh, we, it's about a quarter of what we'd expect in a conventionally operated building, so a lot less energy expended. You can see here there's kind of a California lifestyle that we tried to put into the office environment, something Dave Packard was pretty fond of himself. Um, you can see here there's large sliders, um, glass windows that open up in uh, our connector areas, allowing a significant amount of airflow when the temperatures are such that allow us to do so. And uh, perhaps a little less obvious, in the ceilings you see what appears to be little lamps. Those aren't lamps, those are actually a manifestation of our chilled beam in open area. So we have all the, these operable windows and operable doors. The question is, well, how do you get staff to know what to do, when to open and close your windows? So we have on the, on the left is a little indicator in our connector areas. If you probably can't read that, but the yellowish bar says outdoor conditions are suitable for opening windows. Um, the challenge we found was this little um, feature was only in our connector area. So if you sat at your desk all day answering emails like myself, you didn't actually see it's time to open windows. So we actually engineered a little pop-up icon that's depicted on the right that shows up in, on everyone's computer screen and said, you can open your windows now, or it's more efficient to do so. What we're trying to do here, I mean, right now we have this moral expectation if you dirty a dish in the lunchroom, you're supposed to take that and put it in the dishwasher. Similarly, the idea is to participate with the building when this pop-up icon shows, your, uh, your behavior is expected now to open or, or close the window. So far, we're getting uh, a lot of participation, much greater participation than on putting your dirty dishes away. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the increased efficiency in the design come from our basement. So this is low pressure drop design pipe. So instead of being at a typical 90 degree angle that you'd see in most basements, it's like 130 degree angle, big slopes. The uh, diameter of the piping is significantly larger, meaning you need less pressure to push the fluids through the pipes. And there's variable speed pumping, as opposed to non-variable, I guess, or on-off pumping. All of that saves a significant amount of energy. Um, another helpful factor is the thermal envelope that we actually created. So here's a depiction trying to get at uh, one aspect of that thermal envelope, which is very important in this well-lit building, is are the windows themselves. So you, can all, you can't really make it out, but these are inch and a half argon gas filled triple element windows. Triple element, two panes of glass, and then there's a reflective barrier that's suspended in between that actually uh, pushes out uh, thermal gains for, for the energy. Let's see, running through here. Here's, uh, I'm running out of time. So here's external blinds that protect, pr protect us against the thermal, ga uh, thermal gain. They're deployed in accord with a solar calendar, so we don't really have to worry too much about that. Oops. Here is another uh, aesthetically pleasing way to reduce thermal gain. Uh, one area of our roof not color, uh, covered by solar panels is covered by this living roof. Uh, in terms of lighting reductions, here's one uh, light neighborhood that we have. Um, we have narrow 40-foot footprint that maximizes natural daylighting, and then uh, second story and first story windows allow a tremendous amount of light to come in. There's a light shelf there that actually doubles as a heating element because there's uh, actually copper tubing closer to windows to increase the comfort of those occupants nearer to the windows. Uh, at the time we built the building, LEDs weren't up to the task, so these are um, fluorescent lights, T8s, that um, detect the amount of lumens in the, in the room and, and allow a sufficient amount of lighting in accord with what natural light provides. Um, significant amount of plug low reductions from occupancy 
sensors that we have for video display screens. We do have LED task lighting um, on the desk and whatnot. Another shot of our courtyard area. I'll just wrap up by saying I think the idea here is, you know, uh, we're, we're hopefully going to achieve our net zero s status upon the year occupancy mark, which is uh, coming up in the middle of July. But the real magic here is not our achievement of it, but if others out there, like many of you, can replicate this technology elsewhere, I think there's a significant amount of uh, momentum we can achieve on our small blue speck of Earth. <laughs>you know, NASA contributed the picture of the pale blue dot. Uh, it's the first picture of planet Earth taken off the planet. Uh, that gave us the kind of perspective that um, we heard uh, Stephen Chu talk about before. So we had an opportunity at NASA Ames a few years ago to build the first new building that we've built on our campus in 25 years. So we have um, a much older infrastructure, uh, buildings that go back to the 1940s in some cases. Uh, the last building we built was in the late 60s. So this was an opportunity to do something special. Um, I wasn't involved in the project in the beginning, but I went to the 30% design review of the new building that we were gonna build, and I looked at a building that could have been built in 1990. It was a very um, uninteresting building, um, a building that um, did not embrace sustainability and energy efficiency. And I just stood up at this meeting and called time out, and I said, no, we are not going to build that building. We're going to build a building um, that should be built in the 21st century in the heart of Silicon Valley by NASA, and we're going to make a statement. And the building that we decided to build uh, at the time, was we had a lot of intentions for this building. Uh, the, we intended this building to be uh, one of the highest performing buildings in the federal government. We intended it to be a lead platinum building and we intended to embrace um, and embody and incorporate um, NASA technology that has been used and tested and developed for aerospace applications and bring those technologies back to a building on planet Earth. So that's what we've done, and I'll tell you in, in the eight or nine minutes I have left, I'll tell you the story of that building uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, so we call it Sustainability Base, and we gave it that name to honor the astronauts, the Apollo astronauts that landed at Tranquility Base. And when we gave it the name, it was the 40th anniversary of that Apollo 11 landing. So in honor of them, we thought we'd call it Sustainability Base here back on planet Earth. Um, it's a 50,000 square foot building. Um, it's an office building primarily, uh, no server rooms, no wet labs, about 220 occupants, and it is LEED Platinum certified. We got our LEED Platinum certification uh, last April uh, in 2012. Uh, you can see some of the design features of the building. Uh, um, it's got an exoskeleton. I won't go into all the reasons and benefits of, of the choice for that, um, but it actually affords us a great um, many uh, uh, cost-free benefits. It's got a very narrow uh, foot plate, a uh, 52 foot foot plate. Um, we want to bring in as much natural light as possible. You'll hear a lot of the same themes across all of these, uh, these high-performance buildings today. Um, so uh, the architect uh, was William McDonough and partners. Uh, you probably have heard of William McDonough. Um, uh, he, he, he really did a great job for us. Um, AECOM was the architect of record and Swinerton actually built the building. They were the general contractors. So we had a great experience with, Swin with Swinerton. Um, I see Melanie in the, in, the, in the audience here. So uh, it, was a, it was a great project. I really enjoyed working on it. Uh, I'm a neurobiologist. I know nothing about building buildings, <laughs> but I sure learned a hell of a lot. Um, it, it's a beautiful building. We're very proud of it. You can see uh, the vast array of photovoltaics on the roof. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very pretty building, and the occupants actually love it. 
Um, so again, we had a lot of objectives and intentions from the very beginning. We wanted to reduce the impact on the environment. We wanted to minimize energy, energy use. Our goal from the very beginning was to create a building that was, such high, with, that was so high in performance that we could get to about 1.1 watts per square foot of energy consumption. And we're, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about where we are with respect to that goal. We're, we're, get, we're getting close to it right now. And we haven't yet optimized the building. Um, we also had another objective of minimizing potable water uh, use. Our goal was to reduce potable water use in the building by 90% compared to what a conventional building of equivalent size, size would use, and we're very close to that goal. Uh, and also, we wanted to create an, an evolving sustainability research test bed. Uh, we wanted to use this as a living laboratory, and we are doing that. Um, and the last goal, uh, which we are also doing, as I mentioned before, was bringing um, unique NASA technologies back to a building on planet Earth for the benefit of the people of planet Earth. Uh, and we're doing that. Um, so some of the features of the building, um, I'll bring in a lot of natural lighting and outdoor views. Again, we've, we've heard that from our other speakers. Bring in a lot of fresh air. Um, operable windows and floor vents, a lot of workplace flexibility. You can see some of the workspaces here. Uh, the top picture shows you on the second floor down the central spine of each wing of the building. Uh, we have skylights that bring in tremendous amount of natural light. Um, we've done, a, we did a lot of modeling and simulation prior to uh, and as we evolved the design of this building. The modeling and simulation uh, informed us on many design decisions. Um, with our lighting decisions, um, the modeling, uh, the models that we did um, predict that we will have to turn on the overhead lights in the building the equivalent of 40 days per year. Now, I don't know if we're going to achieve that, that objective or not. We're, we're still collecting data on that. The building has really been occupied for only a year. So we're still working through that, uh, and we are collecting the data. Um, but these are, you know, all the lights are on, are automated lights, Lutron light, lighting system with light sensors that are um, controllable in terms of their intensity of output. Um, uh, we have uh, mecha shades that are computer controlled that uh, s do sun sensing and detect glare on the outside of the building that uh, uh, lower and raise as a function of the angle of the sun uh, and the, the direction that the sun is uh, impinging on the building. So all of these features uh, are, worked, are, you know, are designed to work together. Um, and if we have a chance in the discussion later, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the problems there. Um, Architecture, you'll see some of the features. You see the operable upper tier windows. You see the, from the roof, you can see, this was before the photovoltaics were installed. You can see the skylights there. Um, a lot of passive shading uh, was designed uh, to be part of the exoskeleton of the building to make sure we could let in as much natural light as possible but minimize glare and heat gain um, uh, in certain uh, regions of the building relative to the angle of the sun. Uh, Electrical, so we have, uh, as you can see, 432 panels of high performance uh, photovoltaics uh, on the roof. Um, about 30% of the annual uh, building energy demand is uh, provided by these photovoltaics. Um, and uh, we actually lease these through uh, PG&E well, on a 20 year lease. So it wasn't part of the actual building um, construction cost. Uh, what I, I, want to, I want to say that um, our goal here uh, is to, was to create a, a building site that produced more energy than it consumed. Now, the strict, the strict definition of a, a, a net zero energy building is, is not being met by this building. So, and, and that's something we can talk about, is, is just how do we define these things. So our building is connected to the grid and receives all of its power from our local grid at NASA Ames. We put all of the energy that we generate on site back into our grid. So the photovoltaics are putting all of their power output back into our local grid. And we have a second energy producing uh, uh, element uh, on the building site, which is a solid oxide fuel cell, which is uh, manufactured by Bloom Energy, uh, which is their first installation on planet Earth of their second generation fuel cell. Now, um, just one word about this, the, the fuel cell itself and the technology that was developed uh, here to, to produce these bloom boxes actually was a spin out of NASA technology 
The um, K.R. Siddhar, who's the CEO of Bloom Energy, used to work for NASA, and he developed this technology for a Mars rover back in the late 90s. That mission was canceled, uh, never flew, um, and he just got fed up with NASA, understandably, and took his technology and created Bloom Energy. So part of our intention, remember, was to bring NASA technology back to this building. So we thought it was fitting to bring Bloom Energy back to the, to the, to the site. So. Um, this, is a, this system uh, nominally was supposed to produce 200 kilowatts uh, uh, constant output. Uh, it's producing a little less than that, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's the combination of the power produced by the Bloom Energy uh, fuel cells and the photovoltaics uh, is actually producing <laughs> about twice as much energy right now um, that, than the building consumes. Um, it's a completely hydronic building, uh, with one exception, there's one room that it actually has a, uh, a, a, an HVAC system, I can explain that. But the rest of the building is all hydronic. Uh, we put in a, a geothermal well field and a closed loop system uh, right near the building, and um, we uh, use 57 degree constant temperature water cooled by, by Mother Earth. Um, and pump it through uh, these copper tubes that you can see. Well, I don't know if the, the, the guess there isn't a picture of that here. But the, in this, the center panel on the bottom are, the, are, are uh, chill panels that are on the ceilings throughout the building. The back side of those chill panels is just a labyrinth of copper tubes through which this uh, 57 degree water flows on hot days, uh, cooling the air uh, around it. And that cooler air is denser than warm air, and it, that cool air simply floats down passively on the occupants below. Uh, no fans, um, no filters, no freon, uh, fairly low energy compared to an HVAC system to operate. Um, the occupants of the building have uh, been very comfortable. There have been no complaints about thermal management in the building, uh, either summer or winter. Um, and we've, we've got one year's worth of experience now behind our, our belts. Um, we have a solar thermal system on the roof uh, that heats hot, uh, hot water uh, that we can use for radiator, radiant heat uh, f during the winter when we need it. Uh, and we have... Um, uh, in the main lobby of the building, uh, you can see we have a, um, a hydronic system as well in, under the floor. Uh, uh, I mentioned we wanted to bring NASA technology back into the building. This is one of those technologies. This is a, um, a water purification system that currently is uh, being developed by our scientists and engineers at NASA Ames that currently is used on the International Space Station to purify all of the water, gray water and black water for the six astronauts on the International Space Station. We took a updated, upgraded, and larger version of this system and put it at sustainability base, and we're using it to um, recycle, reclaim, and reuse all of the gray water in the building, not the black water, because we don't have to, but the gray water. So all the hygiene water in the building is, uh, through a separate plumbing system, is recaptured and uh, cleaned up by this um, water purification system, sent back into the building, and used for toilet and urinal flushing. So we do not have to waste potable water for that purpose. Uh, also, all of our irrigation is with reclaimed water um, from on site. And um, the combination of those things, plus very efficient uh, 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 plumbing fixtures inside the building, uh, is putting us very close to that 90% uh, figure that we were trying to achieve with respect to the reduction in the pot total potable water use. Um, I mentioned the landscaping. Um, here is the second uh, NASA technology that we're embedding in the building, and uh, this is a work in progress right now. We're building our own uh, internal control system um, uh, up for the building. Uh, this will be an intelligent, adaptive control system that will take sensor data from a distributed network of sensors throughout the building, including the occupants of the building. Um, incorporate those data um, in, uh, it, with uh, data mining algorithms that go out and, uh, and capture the weather forecast from the web, for example, capture the uh, building occupant schedule so they know when a conference room is going to be used by 50 people, it knows what the temperature is supposed to be outside at that particular time, and, uh, and um, adjusts and, uh, and operates the building accordingly. So this is a, a system that's designed to learn from its own performance um, and improve its performance over time. 
So when we put, and all of these software modules exist. Uh, we've flown all of these different modules. It's about five different software modules that are, have been flown in, for aerospace applications <laughs> um, that we're combining in a unique way and, and demonstrating in this building. We expect this system will be finished in about a year or so. Uh, it will ride on top of the current operating system, control system for the building, which is an off-the-shelf Siemens system. So we're looking forward to uh, learning a lot as we do this. Our goal here is like in 10 years that you could go to Home Depot and you could buy one of these water purification systems for your house uh, or you could buy a system like this and have your electrician uh, install it um, in your house to control your house, to save water in your house. Uh, this could be both for retrofits or for new construction. So that's our goal. We want to bring those technologies back to the people of planet Earth since you paid for it in the first place. We pay for it in the first place. Um, we've won a, no a number of awards. I won't go through any of these, but you can just see that we've had a lot of recognition for the building. Um, and so uh, we're, we're very proud of it. We're learning a lot from it. We invite partnerships. We want to do partnerships with, uh, with companies that have new technologies that can increase uh, our energy efficiency. And um, we use sustainability base as a platform that they can learn about their product, we can learn about their product, and test it objectively. Um, in a living laboratory. So that's our story on sustainability base. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so you have seen uh, quite a few parallel themes in strategies used in these different buildings. Um, so think about questions you want to ask them um, in terms of, uh, well, what's next? Uh, what didn't work, we heard a lot of things that seemed to work, uh, but I'll leave that up to you. But uh, start to think about the questions. Um, before that, uh, Stephen Selkowitz from LBNL will give us a bit of a broader perspective on the concept of net zero energy buildings. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. So um, I'm going to start a little bit more from the applied research side, and, and it's great to see more and more examples of these kinds of buildings coming along. Uh, we've been involved in working with the people that supply the technology for them, that supply the tools for them, and ultimately also monitoring and measuring what goes on. And there's a kind of a good news, bad news story here. The good news is that there are some innovators out there that you've seen this morning doing some good work. Um, in general, this is a harder challenge than I think some people think it is, and that's going to be part of my message this morning. So I just want to put this in context, the issue of do we, do we need net zero buildings? This is a plot of um, energy use over time from 50s to the mid 70s and then it the, the 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 blue line this is let's see do i have a yeah the blue line is total energy use what people are talking about now are goals california goals national goals that go down 20 50 even 80% out to the 20 20 30 20 50 time range if you're going to achieve these kinds of goals then you have to be then buildings have to be performing at the level of net zero or, or, approximately. If your goal was to keep this going at a slower rate, save 10, 20 percent, there's lots of simple things you could do. But since buildings are 40 percent of all energy use, they're 71 percent, 72 percent of all the, the electricity use, you've got to do something dramatic in buildings if you're going to make this kind of a change. So the vision is net zero, and by, by net zero we could spend a full session talking about what it means. For, for me, it means driving the intrinsic use of the building down 60 to 80 percent from what it would normally be and then providing the rest with on-site renewables. Now, it's a dirty little secret that you really can't get. And if you talk about buildings being net zero on their footprint, you, you simply can't do it for a good part of the, of the nation's building stock. Any building more than about five or ten stories, any building in an urban area, a building with a data center, restaurants, hospitals, you're never going to get those net zero by the definition on the site. But the definition isn't sacrosanct. You could put PV on the parking lot. You could put B, P, PV on the building next door. You could have bloom cells with methane that comes from some other source. So I think it's actually a mistake to get caught up in the details of the definition and think more about where we're going. So my, my main point here is that I, I, I circulate in lots of different worlds, and part of that world it's let's just go do it. That's the, the, the dream part here. And the part on the bottom is the reality of actually making it work it takes hard work, it takes innovation, it takes leaders, and you've seen a few of them here this morning, to try it. There's an expression out there that if it exists, it must be possible. So the fact that there's several hundred examples of these buildings is great. It means we can do it. The fact is there are five million 
commercial buildings, and the fact that we've got several hundred of them built means we have an awful long way to go. So if I were to spend an hour with you, I'd walk through this long list of things that I think are, are parts of what I'm calling the, the grand challenge for buildings. And I'm going to have a slide or two on a couple of them, on life cycle, on measuring performance, on integrated smart systems, that you just heard about the relation to the grid, people, and technology and policy. And, and I don't know what Stanford will do, but I'm perfectly happy to make all these slides available later because we're not going to go through them in great detail. So this is my, my theme from before, that if, if our goal is simply to improve buildings by 5 or 20 percent, 5 to 20 percent, there's lots of simple things we can do. We don't need R&D. We, we don't need complex sort of systems in place. But if we're going to get 50 percent plus or minus, then we, then we need to go to integrated building systems. And again, you saw three examples. Every one of the last case studies here talked about integration as a major theme. So that's going to be critically important. And from a different type of integration, there's no silver bullet here. There's not a magic light bulb. There's not a magic window. There's not a magic heat pump that's going to do this. And policy, for example, by its own won't do it. You can implement any policy you want. I mean, I said before, California has a net zero, every building net zero by 2030 policy. That's a great policy because it's aspirational and puts a stake in the sand, but it simply isn't physically going to happen because you simply can't technically do it. So I think you need this whole combination of things working in sync in order to make the world change. Now, to put a little more quantitative data to, I'm going to phrase it this way, how bad the problem is. This is an interesting study done a few years ago. 120 buildings, what the design energy use was and the measured energy use. And the first thing you see is there's lots of scatter. If every building performed exactly as designed, all the points would be on the diagonal. They aren't, right? They're all over the map. The part that worries me is the buildings down here that were supposed to be on the left-hand side that were the most efficient buildings. These are the net zero or could be net zero buildings. A few of them met the goal. Many of them were 100% more. Some of them were 200% more. So, you know, as a scientist who cares about data, I would say there's a, there's a big, big red flag. Why, why is that? And, and, and the reason is because of sort of some of the issues I talked about in the slide before, a few slides before. So if you think about a framework, how, how would we, if we redid that slide five years from now, how would we get all the points to be in the line? We've been talking to architects and engineers about the, the goal ought to be to guarantee the performance of the buildings. I almost don't care, and I'm saying almost because I actually do care. I almost don't care what the target numbers are. What's more important is you put a process in place that delivers what you expect. And again, each of the three prior speakers said that in slightly different words. And so I would almost argue here, to go out on a little bit of a limb, that it's more important to be thinking about building and operating buildings that way rather than explicitly what the actual technical goal is. And in order to do that, you need to then do a whole bunch of stuff in the area of design in terms of tools and, and you need to build, build better buildings, you need to operate better buildings. And then the other issue here is scale. Um, again, in a, in a research environment, we love to do one-off kinds of things, but to solve the national problem, we're going to have to do better than that. Um, so I'm going to flash one slide per topic for a few things. Life cycle. A huge problem today is that all the great effort that goes into design, five years later, th three years later, five years later in operations, no one knows what the hell the building was supposed to do or how it was supposed to operate. And as you put more sophisticated, you know, I'm, this is the real world, right? And I think my friends here, at least over beers, would probably agree with me, right? And maybe in public discussion. So one of the areas, information model, BIM, SIFI at Stanford has been a leader in pushing this forward. We need to protect, preserve, and promulgate the information, share it, and make it much more useful. And there's a lot of activity in this area now. Um, we're, we, one of the things we do is develop simulation tools for energy. And one of the breakthroughs here isn't so much the algorithms, although they're improved a bit, but it's that the input to these tools now can come from an IFC BIM import. So this is the architect works in the BIM environment. And rather than having the engineer recreate all the stuff, you import the drawing. And hopefully, it actually works. That's the challenge here. Uh, this is a new tool that is being developed. There's a big push now in the Department of Energy on data. So tools are important, but tools are only part of it, and how do buildings really perform? It turned out that when Stephen Chu asked this question a few years ago at DOE, there wasn't a lot of data available. And so there's been a big project now at DOE, the Building Performance Database. It now has 70,000 buildings in it, and the criteria to put your data into that database are 
pretty, pretty reasonable, pretty tough. And then the idea is that people will build tools on top of that. Energy IQ is a benchmarking tool that operates off of a database, so you can see where your, your, your buildings are relative to others. Another thing that's happening that I think is really important, disclosure laws. In California now, when you sell a lease a building, you have to disclose its performance. So it may have a great rating or lead plaque in the lobby, and you may have made claims, and you may have been written up in the architectural magazine, but you now have to actually tell what it does. New York City, every building over 50,000 square feet has to publicly disclose its performance. And it may not be shocking to hear that there are some buildings that have gotten a lot of press, and they're probably good buildings in some ways, whose energy performance isn't nearly what they claimed it would be. Now it's public information, and people are starting to do something about it. So this is important to me, because it's a motivation that people will actually act on things. So I wanted to pick, for five or six slides, I want to drill down one level and talk about technology. I run a Windows and Daylighting R&D group at the lab as well. And so here's an example, and I think, again, you saw in almost in, in every presentation, they're doing innovative stuff with Windows. So the Windows world has been bounced back and forth between their lousy don't use them on the left to the iconic image of a green building as an all-glass building. And I will say parenthetically, except for James's, which was a retrofit of a tilt-up concrete, there's a lot of glass in the last two buildings you saw, which is fine as long as it's the right glass. So there's all kinds of innovation going on here. These are switchable windows, smart windows. You apply a small current to the coating and it changes. So blinds and shades and shutters are great to control sunlight, but wouldn't it be great if we could do this? This is a NASA type technology. These coatings were used in military aircraft and spacecraft many, many years ago when cost per square foot didn't matter and performance was different, but now we're bringing them down to the point where they could be deployed in buildings. Um, dynamic control of the sunlight coming in is critically important. The, the peak load that a, that a building sees and therefore the utility sees on a hot summer afternoon, 50% or so is lighting and AC, and we can control quite a bit of that between the smart glass and dimmable lighting. We can actually control more than 50% of the net electric load on a hot summer afternoon in a building. So that adds an important, um, or that, that's an important add-on. So this gets into the controls world. How do we deal with controls? And um, this is an opportunity and a challenge, I guess, is the polite way to put it. So conceptually, we want a smart controller, and I think uh, Stephen talked about the systems they're developing now at, at, at NASA. It looks at all these different inputs and maybe more and figures out what to do and then operates the, the, the windows, the lighting, the HVAC, and so on. Now, that smart controller could be a person. If you can motivate and train people and they have access and so on, you can open the window. But in lots of conditions, people are not going to dim lights and open windows. I mean, my office right now may have the sun pouring in it. I'm not there to open the window or pull the shades, right? And that impacts the cooling in, in, in the building I'm working. So conceptually, I've, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I buy into the idea that we should go for high-performance high integrated systems with smart controllers. Making it work is another story. So my last piece here is some work that we're doing now to try to figure out how to make that work. And we've done a lot of work with test beds. Test beds combine theory and practice and the real world. And you're building stuff at a scale where you can find out what works and what doesn't work. <clears throat> and we've done this with electrochromic glass, with exterior shading, with daylight redirecting glass. And then the question is, OK, you can show that it works at a couple hundred square feet, but can it work in a building? So we were brought in by the New York Times as an owner of this million square foot building to see if we could make these things work at that scale. And they actually built a 5,000 square foot test bed just for their building. We did a lot of modeling, a lot of measurement, end result, the building was built in 2000 and occupied 2007. We did a POE study last year. 40% uh, or 50% lighting energy savings compared to code, 25% electrical savings compared to code, and, and the occupancy study said people were very happy. So the stuff can work, it can be done at scale, and it can be done in sort of an environment like this as well as the smaller buildings you saw this morning. So making these systems work, um, not just at the level of the space, but the whole building and ultimately the grid is critically important. And looking at where you make investments, I don't have time to go into the details here, but you know, if you invest uh, in smart glass and better lighting, you can reduce chiller size, you can reduce the size of the PV cell. So there's an optimization here piece that's important. I'm just going to show you a facility we're building now. This is a reconfigurable kit of parts facility. This is what it will look like in front of our existing building. Four of these chambers, one of them can rotate. Um, all the pieces and parts can be plugged in and plugged out and tested. So this will allow us to test 
all the kinds of systems, things you've seen this morning, things yet to be done, either in the R&D stage, sort of over here on the left, or all the way through the use by early adopters and scalable deployments. So these are, this is designed to be used by manufacturers and researchers, but also to be used by architects and owners as well to prove things out. So this is, what, 25 miles from here? People complain it's only in the Berkeley climate, which is a dull, uninteresting climate. But actually, what we'll do is we combine it with all the simulation models, and we can extrapolate the results. But I'm guessing many of you are from the Bay Area, so it might be appropriate as is. So this is a win-win-win. If we can make these systems operate properly, we keep people happy, which is the most important thing. It's the most important cost, but it's most important for other reasons as well. We can make building owners and operators happy in terms of saving energy and managing the grid, and ultimately we contribute to solving the global greenhouse gas problem. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for this uh, broader perspective. Um, so if you stick with the uh, late start, um, if you're okay with letting others go through the uh, food line first, uh, we have time for a few questions. So if you have a question, please uh, come to the microphone. Hi, I have a comment and a question. And my background is in architecture. I'm an architect in California. And my comment is, my, and Mr. Selkowitz, my, my brain locked up a little bit when you talked about guaranteeing the performance of, uh, yep. of buildings. And I know from an architect's standpoint, uh, there's some significant issues with that. And, um, Seems to that it, would, it seems that it would really require an industry transformation in terms of architects and builders and even owners collaborating on that relationship in order for any type of guarantee to, to be made. So I think it's a great idea, and I recognize there's some real challenges as well as opportunities there. Um, my, the second part is a question for the three gentlemen that presented uh, actual buildings. And I'm wondering if you can comment on the cost per square foot of, of the construction of your projects. Obviously, we had a renovation in two new office buildings. And again, as an architect working on large-scale commercial projects in California, that's the sticking point for many of our clients is what's the added cost and when are we going to start to see a payback for this? And if it's not within a very short time frame, usually a lot of these ideas, these technologies are not end up not being feasible in, in projects. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Uh, so direct answer, $475 a square foot for a replicable warm shell. So you can have everything you see there except for the fine fits and finishes, you know, the western red cedar applied on the outside, recycled copper and all that. So that's kind of a kind of direct answer. Our estimates are there's as much as a, as a 20 percent increase uh, for the sustainable features of the building uh, versus a building that didn't have those sustainable features. You know, uh, from a hard-nosed CFO perspective, the net zero um, improvements are easily justifiable to me in terms of cost recovery. Some of the other things have less of a discernible ROI. It's more of a moral ROI when you look at, uh, you know, reutilizing, we use reutilized or recycled 95% of the building material that was on site for the buildings we tore down to put our building in. What's the ROI on that? Didn't go to a landfill. It's, it's tougher math, but. Um, our case is a little bit unique in that we purchased the land, the building, so that, that's one cost there, you know, and all the permitting and everything that goes with it. And then the other aspect was the, the design and construction and, you know, the long-term energy cost. So we had to factor all that in. So I don't have the square foot cost, but I know roughly to purchase the land was about one and a half million, um, including building. And it's a good size piece of land, and there's also an opportunity to build another building on it in the future. So that was part of the equation that looked good for us. Uh, but I do know between buying the land and doing uh, the design and construction that if we had gone out and leased some property and did a classic tenant improvement, the payback was under five years. So that's why I think we got executive approval. So I think we got to change our mindset of, and I know you probably struggle with this because you're trying to guide clients and look at the bigger picture, but a lot of them just are locked into this. So what's how much is going to design the initial cost, and that's it. So I think you're, I'm with you 100%. We've got to change our industry's mindset into take a more holistic or integrated approach to all this, but it's tough. So, I'm, I'm. Yeah, in our case, it's also a very different model than you're probably used to because this is a federal building uh, that you paid for. Um, and the total cost, this is 50,000 square foot building. I, I'll let you do the math. Um, it's uh, just, 
close to $27 million uh, total. Um, we calculated, it was interesting to hear your number just now about uh, 20% um, uh, cost premium for the, uh, all of the sustainable features of the building and energy saving features. Uh, we did a back of the envelope calculation on our building and um, now some of our uh, uh, stuff was f basically free because it was passive. Uh, energy savings and uh, on, on our exoskeleton, uh, which didn't really cost us very much. Um, but our back of the envelope cal calculation was that we paid about 6% over, pre over premium, over what the building would have cost us for an equivalent building. Um, and our back of the envelope calculation is about nine years for payback. So we think for the American taxpayer, this is a good deal. Uh, we think our building will require lower maintenance, uh, certainly lower utility costs, et cetera. Um, so over the long haul, over a 40-year lifespan or so of the building, uh, we think the American taxpayer is actually getting a good deal. Plus, we're going to learn a lot, and we want to bring these technologies back to the American taxpayer uh, that, so that they can benefit in the future. So in some ways, we're willing to take that upfront cost uh, so we can reduce risk for consumers in the future if these products can, can be licensed and made available commercially. <coughs> Stephen, did you want to comment on the issue, the, the comment on uh, guaranteeing performance? Well, one of the reasons for phrasing it that way is to get people's attention is to, you know, because, and, and, and it does. And so I would only say, be happy to talk about it more offline, but um, the guarantee is like the EPA mileage guarantee. The fine print says, you know, it's 34 miles per gallon, and the fine print says, but if you go uphill all the time, or you go downhill or whatever, it'll change. And so... The main thing is accountability, is to, is to get people thinking about it, and more important, to connect design, construction, and operations. So I don't, again, actually care about the guarantee part of it. We use different words as well. But it does wake people up. It does get the, the lawyers kind of interested, which we don't want to spend too much money there. But it, but, but it is a game changer, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I mean, turning it around, I do see some uh, design and construction firms who say, hey, we can guarantee a certain performance to the owner on a certain condition. So, I mean, you can turn it around as well as a business opportunity. And I, I have to believe, I mean, it's, it's well known, unless you can keep the car between the lines, you can't learn to go fast. And I think that's uh, what Steve's comment was about, uh, le yeah, we need to be, uh, learn to set a target and actually meet it, um, not to have a scatter plot like we saw. So it is an absolute gate changer in the, in the building world, uh, that's for sure. And just to add, this is something short of a guarantee, but it's indicative of changing business processes. One of the things that we did after building our building is we established a year-long post-occupancy services team, at which table sat us as the operator along with DPR, our contractor, and EHDD, who designed the building. So we all sat together, so at the end of the year, we don't point to them and say, you didn't build us a net zero building. And they point back to us, you didn't operate a net zero. We <laughs> sat there the whole time working together through items and uh, that might get us closer to a guarantee. And if I could add to that, I mean, one, I think sort of Martin alluded to this, so the top industry firms, and I, I, we're seeing this particularly with builders, is this whole idea of becoming an integrated firm that we predict in the future we're going to have to be able to deliver what we call performance-based contracts, not just simply on price, but on performance. So we are gearing up our whole organizations to move in that direction. <coughs> and we're doing that now in our, so, our renewable energy group. When we build a solar power plant, our you know, developer like a, um, expects a certain amount of output, and we have to produce that. So we're already in that game. You know, We're just sort of broadening it now. So it's, it's going to require a big reorganization in an industry. So I'd say however you get into the integrated game is you're going to be your, your ticket into that. All right. I suggest we formally close the panel. Uh, thank the uh, speakers. And I'm sure they're happy to talk to you uh, right here or over lunch. And uh, thank you for attending this uh, panel. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.